Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeremy De Silva from Boston University, who's going to talk about foot and ankle diversity in Australopithecus. Well, thank you all very much for the uh, invitation to come here and speak. Um, I'd like to move the conversation south a bit, from the pelvis down to the foot, and talk about, as Chris said, uh, foot and ankle diversity in Australopithecus. It really does need saying that there is no other mammal on Earth that walks quite the way we do. Uh, so of course, scientists have tried to figure this out. When did upright walking evolve? Why did it evolve? And how? How have we acquired our bipedal adaptations? And central to this argument, as Chris and Steve have pointed out, has been the genus Australopithecus. Um, Australopithecus lived in Africa from two to four million years ago. You've already been introduced to it. Lucy, the new specimens of Australopithecus sediba from Malapa Cave, which I'll discuss at the very end of my talk. And again, as Chris and Steve already nicely laid out for me, there have been a number of different hypotheses to explain the locomotion in these creatures. The first is that they walked, walked with a crouched gait, uh, what, what uh, some call the, the groucho gait, the bent hip, the bent knee, and that they had not yet acquired full upright striding bipedalism like you see in humans today. Others interpret the very same fossils differently, that these were uh, capable upright walkers and that human-like bipedalism has deep roots in our, uh, in our past. And others say it depends on the species you're talking about that there might actually be a mosaic uh, or different ways of moving on two legs uh, throughout the past. I'd like to examine these three ideas uh, from the point of view of the foot. The human foot is strikingly different from the foot of our ape relatives. Um, there are a number of differences, but in, in my view, these are the biggies. Apes have a very, a very small heel. They have an ankle that's well adapted for climbing. They have a flexible midfoot, something called the mid-tarsal break that I'll talk about in just a moment and they have a big toe that can, they, they can grasp with. In stark contrast, humans have a, a, a large heel to deal with the forces of, of heel strike during upright walking. We have an ankle well adapted for walking, not for climbing. We have a stiff midfoot that allows us uh, some propulsion rather than grasping abilities uh, in our midfoot. And we have a big toe in line with the other toes. Well, how did this all happen? That's, of course, the million dollar question. And what do we rely on to figure this out? Well, we look at fossils. We rely very heavily on fossils, but unfortunately for those of us that study fossil feet, there have been very, very few fossil foot bones. Over 50 years ago, Louis Leakey, working in Olduvai Gorge, uh, made a pretty phenomenal discovery, a partial foot of a single individual. This is the very famous OH8, or Olduvai hominid eight foot, uh, which consists of all of a left foot minus the heel and the toes. And over the course of the next 50 years, a whole lot of people have had a whole lot to say about this foot. <laughs> if I miss your name, I apologize. <laughs> um, well, if you wanted to study foot evolution, this is pretty much the only game in town for a long time. Uh, I've even thrown my hat in the ring recently as well. And you would think that with such a complete foot, there would be some consensus, and there's not. Uh, we can't agree as a field what species this foot belongs to. We can't agree whether it's an adult or a juvenile. I happen to think this is in, in a, the foot of an old female robust Australopithecus. Some think it's the foot of a juvenile Homo habilis. We can't agree on the function of this foot. So we desperately need more foot fossils, I suppose. Well, researchers working in these East African deposits, uh, two million years old or so, uh, have made extraordinary discoveries. These partial skulls illustrated here are just a few of what was found. But the foot bones found in those very same deposits could fit into the palm of your hand. Very, very few foot bones found from Olduvai Gorge and from Kubifora. Don Johansson, working in three million year old sediments at Hadar, uh, well, he had a little bit more luck, I suppose. He found Lucy. Um, but he also found many uh, fossilized foot bones, including this partial foot uh, skeleton shown on the, on the lower right, right here, shown as, uh, that I'm gonna refer to as the, as the Hadar foot. Um, huh, but the paleoanthropological gods can be cruel sometimes. Um, what is preserved of the Hadar foot is not preserved of the OH foot and vice versa. And so one cannot infer the remaining uh, anatomy of one foot from the other. Unfortunately, these bones as well are from different species and from things that lived over a million years apart in time. Now, fortunately, during those very same years, Mary Leakey and colleagues unearthed this really extraordinary set of track, uh, footprints of an early species of, of human that lived over three and a half million years ago, the Laetoli footprints. I'll return to these in a moment. Um, now, as extraordinary as these are, and they certainly are extraordinary, it sure would be nice 
to know more about the skeleton of the foot that made this, that would fit into this slipper, if you will. So, of course, in the 1970s and 80s, researchers continued to look for these fossilized bones, and they found remarkable partial skeletons. Lucy, shown on the left there, and the one and a half million year old juvenile Homo erectus from Narikotome, shown on the right. But what I'll point out to you is no feet, or very few feet. Lucy has three foot bones of the 52 she would have had in life, and the Narikotome skeleton preserves maybe one. There's one that could be a first metatarsal. In fact, the most complete foot of any partial skeleton found into, up into the mid-1990s in East Africa is this. Eight bones of a very fragmentary Homo erectus skeleton that has been unceremoniously named KNMER 803. Um, very little has been done with this foot, by the way. It's actually a lot more interesting than I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting as it here. Um, now, the other window into human evolution is South Africa, of course, but it has fared no better in our quest for understanding foot evolution. Great skulls, even a couple of partial skeletons, but again, no feet. Now, there are plenty of foot bones that have been recovered from S South Africa, but these are isolated finds. Almost all are from different individuals, many of which probably from different species. Call me crazy, but I like to think that in order to really understand foot evolution, we need feet. <laughs> Not just isolated foot bones, but of course you work with what you have. And I do believe that every fossil, no matter, no matter how small or how fragmentary or how isolated, has an interesting story to tell. I also really think that every fossil deserves to have its story told. So we do work with these fossilized bones, usually asking the question of whether they're more human-like or more ape-like in the ways that are functionally relevant. So we can return to that list again. As we already mentioned, humans and apes have very, very different feet. So what about Australopithecus? Are they more human-like or are they more ape-like for these particular characters? Or are they somewhere in between the two? Or do we see a mosaic with some being more human-like and others being more ape-like? Well, let's start with that large heel. Unfortunately, once again, very few heel, heel bones, uh, calcanei, but there are a couple from Hadar, and uh, these fall well within the human range of distribution for the size of their heel. These are big heel-striking individuals, in my opinion. So we can check that, I believe, in the human column, although it'd be nice to have a few more. Um, what about the ankle now? Well, some of my research has looked into how the ankle is adapted for climbing in non-human uh, apes. So here's a chimpanzee climbing a tree, off he goes. And what really struck me when these guys were climbing is not that they climbed backwards, but that they had an incredible range of flexion at the ankle joint. They could flex their ankle about 45 degrees when they were climbing, so pretty much they could take the top of their foot and shove it up against their shin. That's pretty remarkable. Next slide. Um, if I did that, you'd be driving me to the hospital right now. <laughs> Now notice, uh, this is going to leave its effect on the, bo on the bones. Uh, this is the ankle from the point of view of the foot. Uh, on the left is a chimpanzee, on the right is a human. And notice that humans have a very square-shaped ankle joint. Chimpanzees, in contrast, have a trapezoid-shaped joint. And this helps with uh, the, the, the forces of climbing on a highly flexed foot. Notice as well, illustrated with the red uh, arrows here, uh, something called the medial malleolus. That's the chunk of bone on the inside of your ankle. In apes, it's quite large. In humans, it's quite small. And this, I thought, was reflecting climbing on a twisted in or inverted foot. OK, what about Australopithecus? Well, we've got 14 ankles from Australopithecus and early members of genus Homo, and they're all strikingly human-like. They all have a square-shaped ankle joint and, and a reasonably thin medial malleolus. I think Australopithecus ankles are well adapted for walking. Now, what this means to me is that if they were still climbing trees, which many people suspect that they were, as we, we've heard about, um, they weren't doing it like any modern ape climbs. So what about the midfoot region now, the stiff midfoot that humans have versus the mobile midfoot you see in apes? Well, this is something called the mid-tarsal break. When apes lift their heel, they establish a new fulcrum right in the middle of their foot. They have a floppy foot. They can kind of fold their foot in half. Humans don't have this at all. We have a very stiff, rigid midfoot because we have ligaments in the bottom of the foot that present, prevent this. And we also have bones that lock together that produce a very rigid bottom of the foot. So how can we tell about Australopithecus, whether they had a rigid foot or not? Well, one of the bones that indicates to us that an animal has a rigid midfoot or not is the bone that's illustrated here. This is, called the, morth uh, this is the fourth metatarsal. 
And the base of the fourth metatarsal, in animals that have midfoot mobility and can kind of fold their foot in half, have a very convex or curved fourth metatarsal base. Humans, in contrast, have a very flat uh, uh, fourth metatarsal base. There are now four Australopithecus fourth, metatars four me fourth metatarsals, and they all look strikingly human-like. They're not halfway between human and ape. They're quite human-like for this particular character. So it suggests to me that they didn't have a floppy foot, midfoot either. Now, finally, while some would certainly disagree with me on this one, I interpret the very few isolated foot bones that we have that are relevant to the question of whether there was a grasping big toe or not in Australopithecus as strong evidence that they did not have a grasping big toe. And central to this issue are the footprints, the Laetoli footprints, that show, at least in my opinion, a uh, prominent heel strike, the lack of midfoot flexibility, and a big toe in line with the others. And there have been two recent studies, pretty sophisticated analyses, looking at these Laetoli footprints, suggesting that they walked, whoever made these, walked with a very human-like gait. Now, I'm not arguing that Australopithecus walked exactly like you and I do. Their foot bones were not exactly like yours and mine. They had longer, more curved toes than we did, and they had a little more mil uh, mobility in certain joints of their feet. Um, so why? Well, they may very well have still been climbing trees to some degree. Maybe they were building night nests, especially to stay away from those predators. Um, or perhaps the infants had more grasping ability to hold on to their moms prior to the invention of strollers and baby Bjorns. That may have been a really important driving factor here. So central to the, to the argument, of course, are these Australopithecines, getting at the question of whether there was more of a gradual evolutionary change in upright walking, or whether these things were good obligate upright right walkers. And, and as you can probably tell, at least from the point of view of the foot and the ankle, I tend to support this middle hypothesis, that these things were quite good upright walkers. However, this was all based on those isolated foot bones. It would be really nice, again, to have some feet with associated skeletons. And again, right up until the mid-1990s, all we had were these isolated foot bones. And then, and then the floodgates opened. Um, first, Littlefoot. Littlefoot was discovered in South Africa and announced in 1995. It's a nearly 3 million year old uh, Australopithecus partial skeleton, um, remarkable specimen. It was originally published in 1995 as possessing a grasping toe, a uh, grasping big toe, and certainly um, if you only have these four bones, you can arrange these in a way that suggests that there is a grasping big toe. There are more bones that have been found, and when they fit in like a puzzle piece, the first toe and the second toe are right in line with each other. I don't think this thing had a grasping toe, at least in my judgment, it refutes the hypothesis of a grasping big toe in little foot, but this thing did have a grasping big toe. Artipithecus ramidus, a four and a half million year old skeleton from Ethiopia, a remarkable specimen uh, living a million years prior to Lucy, showing a, a, a just amazing foot skeleton in, uh, attached to a partial skeleton uh, of, of, of this female Artipithecus. In the year 2000, Zoraya Lemziged found the skeleton of a three-year-old female Australopithecus afarensis, the Dikika child, a, a magnificent specimen, quite complete, and she has a foot. And this foot here is shown as it was published in 2006, uh, still within its matrix. It has now been fully prepped out, and I can assure you it is absolutely magnificent. The Demonisi fossils from uh, uh, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, 1.8 million years old, which means we finally know a little bit more about what the foot of Homo erectus looks like. And on the island of Flores, the feet of the puzzling Homo floresiensis, found in association with this really unusual and amazing skeleton, LB1, of a female hobbit. So in just 15 years, we've gone from having essentially no skeletons with associated feet to having five, and now six, and seven. The specimens from Malapa, South Africa, have feet associated with their skeletons, and these are bound to get more complete as more and more fossil material is pulled from this cave site. But as exciting as these new skeletons are, and they certainly are incredibly exciting, we already know what the foot of Australopithecus looks like, right? It has a large heel, an ankle adapted for walking, a stiff midfoot for propulsion, and a big toe in line with the other digits. So we already know what the foot of Australopithecus sediba should look like. And plus, these are only two million years old, and as Steve already illustrated, in many ways these look more human-like than, uh, than, than previous Australopithecines. So if anything, these feet should look more like yours and mine. And they don't. They don't at all. First, the heel. 
The Australopithecus sediba heel is incredibly small, and it has this hook-like beak on the bottom, quite reminiscent of what we see in a chimpanzee, what we see in a gorilla. This does not have a big, large heel that you see in things that lived a million years prior to this. What about the ankle? Well, rem remember, humans have a square-shaped ankle joint and a thin medial malleolus, like chunk of bone in the inside of your foot, as all Australopithecines do as well, except for sediba which has a square-shaped ankle joint and this incredibly thick medial malleolus. So it's human-like in one respect, but then quite ape-like in the thickness of the medial malleolus, suggesting it was climbing uh, with a, a, a bit of an inverted foot. This hasn't been published yet, but I'm really excited about this. Um, the stiff midfoot that we discussed that you see in Australopithecus, they align themselves with humans, is not found in Australopithecus sediba. It tends to have a convex, or at least the specimen has a convex base, suggesting quite a, f a bit of midfoot mobility in this particular species. We don't know about the big toe yet, but for all of the features that we said Australopithecus was human-like, this foot is not. It's decidedly not at all. So this suggests to me that the hominids from Malapa could not possibly be walking in the same way that humans walk today, and probably was not walking in the same way that earlier Australopithecines, or even Australopithecines living at the same time, were walking either. And fortunately, we don't just have the foot, but there's the, the hip, as you heard about, and there's the knee, and, and, and soon we're uh, gonna present a hypothesis for how we think this thing was actually moving around its landscape. So what does this all mean? Well, it suggests to me two things. First, the Malapa hominids demonstrate to steal a line from a colleague of ours, Bruce Latimer, who's a foot guy. He said in press recently that based on these fossils, there is more than one way to skin the bipedal cat. And I think he's probably right, that the Sediba material and the other material of Australopithecine suggests that there must have been different ways, at least two different ways, of moving around between two and four million years ago. And second, and I'm gonna end on this note, perhaps I'm being a little overly optimistic here, but I like to think that we're entering a, a golden age of paleoanthropology. Isolated bones are wonderful and they're really, really important, but for the first time, we have the opportunity to study not just isolated bones, but partial skeletons, and not just a few of them, but seven of them now. We've got Artie and the Demonisi fossils, and Littlefoot, and the Dakika child, and the Hobbit from, from Flores, and now the Australopithecus sediba material. And there is certain to be more that's gonna be discovered and gonna be published soon. This is a really exciting time for our field, a time when we're gonna be able to answer some of the old questions that we've had, but we're gonna be able to generate a whole barrage of new questions that we never even thought to ask prior to having these in hand. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Thank you all very much.